Great. Well, first of all, thank you so much for um, giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. This paper really feels like the popular kid on the, on, on the block these days because I've seen it at almost every conference. And it's a great opportunity for me to actually dig into it and really understand what it does because I think it's a really neat paper. So I am going to jump straight into it. Um, a brief summary. So what the paper does, it is it proposes a, a theoretical framework to compare automated market making and decentralized exchanges to the traditional limit order book approach that traditional exchanges use. And the key differences between these two uh, ways of operating is that in a traditional limit order book setting, liquidity providers compete both in prices in that they basically want to offer the best prices at which uh, orders are going to be fulfilled, but also in access in that they there some liquidity providers get access to the exchange and some others don't. Um, and another difference is that that's not the case for automated market making and automated market making everybody provides liquidity and there's no competition. And then an, a diff, another difference is that the price impact in a traditional limit order book setting is uncertain it depends both on kind of how many competitors there are and basically what kind of trades come in while in the automated market making setting the price impact is deterministic and predefined by something that is known as the bonding curve and that's specified in the smart contract so there basically whenever you incur a trade you know exactly how you're going to affect prices now what the paper shows and where it really disentangles kind of automated market making from limit order books is that in an automated market making, making setting, uh, the marginal profit of providing liquidity decreases in the size of the pool. While for a traditional limit order book, this really only depends on the extent of competition. So in a way, um, automated market making settings are preferable for liquidity providers when the, the size of the pool is small. Um, and, and that's one of the key things that is also validated in the empirical application. Um, I'm gonna call this welfare. So the, 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 the paper tries to make kind of a normative statement about what, when automated market making settings are better and the way they look, uh, they do that is by analyzing the cost of trading for noise traders. And they find that when, um, and, in, and in these decentralized exchanges, the pools are small uh, when the pools are large, then it's better for noise traders because the, the, the trading fees that they're going to pay are going to be smaller. And ultimately, they're going to validate the theory with uh, data from Uniswap. So uh, my comments really will focus primarily on interpretation and in the implications of the model, because first of all, I think the model is pretty neat. Uh, I think it's an intuitive model and, and a nice way to analyze the set, this, this problem. Uh, there's also a very big data set from Uniswap. There's 40 million transactions that are in that data set. And that data on its own, I think, is really neat, but it's really kind of unutilized in the model because what in the paper, because the only thing that is done is kind of look for basic correlations between pool size and kind of market variables. So that was, I'm not going to talk a lot about the empirics because there's just not that much to talk about it. So what I want to do is I first want to um, walk through a little bit more, uh, walk through how these automated market making uh, exchanges work. So essentially the way they work is there's a pool that is going to contain two assets in, in a certain proportion. So here I'm taking Ethereum as kind of the numeraire and USDT as the token that is going to be traded. Uh, uh, the proportion of Ethereum and USDT is given by a bonding curve that is predetermined and specified in a smart contract. So this is, there's always going to be Ethereum and USDT in this pool according to this proportion. Now, the assets in this pool are provided by a liquidity provider, which provides both assets in, this, in the proportion given by the bonding curve. And then liquidity withdrawal is going to be do, done by an agent that either withdraws USDT and then puts in uh, the amount of Ethereum it needed to kind of balance out the, 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 the pool again or vice versa. So this is kind of um, a market where um, prices basically, transaction prices are going to be specified by this bonding curve. And it's and the way the fees are incurred is that every time a transaction takes place, um, a fee is withdrawn from the amount of assets that the, 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 the liquidity withdrawal would get, and that fee then goes to the liquidity providers. 
Um, in reality, the way it works is that this fee is reinvested in the pool and the pool grows. Uh, but then uh, in the model, at least what they're going to assume is that the fee kind of goes to the liquidity providers and that that's separate, a separate thing. Now, to study this framework, what the paper is really going to do is they're going to make some assumptions. And the assumptions that are going to be made is that there are two types of agents that carry out withdrawals in the market. So there's a noise trader that trades just purely uh, due to idiosyncratic reasons. Um, and then there's an arbitrageur that's going to step in whenever it's profitable to trade. Uh, and in particular, one thing that's really important is that this arbitrageur is essentially going to front run. They're going to trade faster than anybody else whenever there is a profitable investment opportunity. On the other hand, the liquidity provision is going to be uh, done by an agent that is deep pocketed. So there's kind of an infinite supply of these assets and is also indifferent between providing liquidity in this pool or really not doing anything else. So given this framework, I, my main comments are really going to focus on like, how do we think about this model representing reality? And this is kind of a really, a meaningful way of doing this. So uh, my first comment is uh, going to focus on the arbitrageurs. So one of the key assumptions that is made in, in this model is that um, arbitrageurs step in whenever a profitable investment opportunity arises, and they define an, an, a profitable opportunity as being something like the fundamental value of the token changing in a discrete way, either by jumping up or jumping down. Now, when these kind of events happen, what arbitrageurs do is they try to step in before anybody else to bring the, the, the pool back to an equilibrium state. Um, this is what is referred to as picking off because the alternative would be, of course, for the liquidity providers to step in and kind of make this imbalance this out again. But then the arbitrageurs step in and do this first, and therefore part of the fees that the liquidity providers would get then goes to the arbitrageur. So the amount of fees that essentially the liquidity providers get in the setup are reduced when the arbitrageurs trade. Now, this is perfectly fine. I think this is kind of... Uh, an assumption that can be made, but what I really have a hard time is trying to interpret what these arbitrageurs really are in real life. And part of it is because of the way the paper is written. Uh, at times, the paper refers to these arbitrageurs as informed traders, other times it's just arbitrageurs. There's a sentence taken from the paper that just says, um, the informed trader rebalances the amount of ETH and tokens, and then the arbitrageur pays a liquidity fee. But in this model, information is hard to understand because there's no private information. The fundamental value of the token is observed by all agents. It's observed when the price goes up, when the price goes down. So to me, I don't quite understand how we can interpret this as an, as an information-driven trade. It seems to me more than what is happening is that this arbitrageur is stepping in first and is front-running everybody else. So to me, this arbitrageur seems to be more of a high-frequency trader that steps in to balance out this pool when needed rather than this being kind of an informed trader that has, at least in the way I understand informed traders as somebody that has private information that nobody else has. Um, so I think here, it, it, just fine tuning the interpretation would be helpful to, to understand really what is being captured in the model. Uh, next, um, in terms of liquidity provision, um, one of the assumptions that is made is that these liquidity providers first have deep pockets, they have, there's an, inf an infinite supply of the assets, and also that they're indifferent between providing liquidity in the pool and really not doing anything else at all. Um, and then and this is a thing that becomes only really evident when you read the proofs, and the proofs, one of the statements that is made is that the equilibrium size of the pool is implicitly defined by setting the payoff of liquidity provision to zero. Um, now, my, I started really thinking about this, like, what does this mean then? Who are these liquidity providers that are indifferent between not doing anything at all and providing liquidity in, in this pool? And the first thing that came to my mind is that it's, it's costly to provide liquidity in the space, right? Because if we look at the price of Ethereum just from the beginning of the sample to the end of the sample, the price increased by a factor of 10 over that time period. So it doesn't seem to me that these liquidity providers are, should be indifferent. And if they are, maybe that's not the best thing that they should be doing. Um, and 
partially this was first my gut feeling about this. Um, but also then I started really digging a little bit into this and I, and I realized that this is also not the case for equities. There's papers, for example, that show that hedge funds are often liquidity providers in, in stock exchanges. Um, Aragon and Strahan have a JFE paper where they look at kind of how the Lehman collapse affected liquidity in stocks. And they found that when hedge funds held, hedge funds exposed to Lehman held stocks, those stocks had liquid, worse liquidity outcomes. So that suggested that these hedge funds were intermediaries basically providing liquidity for the trading of those stocks. There's another paper in the Journal of Finan uh, Futures Market that shows that algorithmic traders are often liquidity providers in derivatives exchanges. So it seems to me that these two types of investors are not indifferent between providing liquidity or not. They have specific objectives in providing this liquidity. So what I would really like to understand better is what kind of liquidity providers are the authors really thinking about in this space? And more importantly, why are these liquidity providers making a choice of investing or of providing liquidity in a, in a in decentralized exchange versus potentially alternative DeFi products that offer maybe higher uh, profits? Um, I discussed another paper on DAI last weekend. And DAI is, again, a DeFi product where you can provide liquidity in the form of theorem and that and then basically use that as collateral to lever up a, a portfolio. So why is this choice made here? What are these liquidity providers really doing? I think this kind of goes out beyond the scope of this paper, but really to understand this decentralized exchanges, we have to understand them in the context of a broader DeFi setting. Uh, and I think that's something where, where I would like to see a little bit more. Uh, Gustavo, if you could uh, wrap up. Yeah. So my final comment was on, on the event, informational uh, and the events, that these are information events. I, I, I'm not 100% convinced of that. It's hard for, to argue that the fundamental value of these coins is perfectly observed or known. Uh, so I wanted to really, to really kind of dig a little bit deeper into that. How do we think about these events? And what does this imply basically about the model? Because the model is kind of in a steady state but the, if the events are informational in nature, then that would tell us something about a kind of a potential evolution of these prices that is not captured. So I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, um, so the paper presents a neat theoretical framework to compare automated market making to limit order books. Um, and it provides uh, empirical evidence based on Uniswap data. Uh, my main comments on the paper were really on the interpretation and the implications of the model because everything seems to be internally consistent and fine, but I think we still need to understand a little bit more about it. And um, I believe that this is just part of a broader research agenda, really. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo and Alfred. If you, we are at 